Hello everyone, welcome back to this channel. Today we're going to look into A-Level Physics Chapter 7, Matter and Materials. So this is the word cloud of the chapter, it includes the terms that you will learn throughout the video. So if you like the video, please subscribe so that we can bring this channel to more people. That will be the only favor I ask from you. Thank you. And this is the chapter outlined here. I don't want to specify that all these different terminologies, they are all related to each other. Hopefully by the end of the video, you will see the big picture of this chapter. Now let's look into density, the easiest chapter of the day. Its formula is mass divided by volume. It basically measures how closely packed atoms are arranged in the matter. So let's solve a quick question. Say I have a Minecraft carbon cube of 800 gram and its volume of 200 cm cube. How do we calculate the density in these two different units? So to do that, I need to convert my mass into kilogram. I also need to convert my cm cube into meter cube. So do notice that to convert to meter cube, it's not that straightforward. You have to convert the centi first and then multiply them together into standard forms and get the respective meter cube unit. If you're looking for gram per cm cube, make sure that you're using gram as your mass unit and cm cube as your volume unit. Same goes to kilogram and meters cube. So that's just a simple question to help you warm up. Let's move on to pressure. Do note that density plays a role in determining the value of pressure. Now the contact pressure, the formula is force divided by area. We learned in IGCSE physics already. And the unit is Pascal. It basically measures how force is concentrated over a single area. We also have fluid pressure. It's defined as the pressure exerted by a fluid in all direction at a given point. And fluid pressure depending on two things, the density of the liquid, rho, acceleration due to gravity, and depth of the fluid. And the unit is also Pascal. All right, now let's learn how to derive the formula rho gh. We know that we can calculate the volume using area multiplied by height, and mass can also be calculated using density multiplied by volume. So I just substitute the value of volume into this equation. I'll explain why I do this in a while. So that's the weight of the water here. Okay. To calculate pressure under liquid, we know that pressure can be calculated using force divided by area. And in this case, the force that is exerted at the lowest point here will be the weight of the water. So I can replace the force with the weight and I just substitute the value inside this weight equation, cancel out A, then I would have gotten the pressure under liquid, rho gh. And therefore, in this case, it involves a few calculations. You need to know how to get the mass based on density formula. You need to use the weight formula and do some substitution. And you will have found out that the pressure under liquid is rho gh. You will need to learn how to derive it. So let's solve some real questions here. Now, assuming that I have two points in this water tank, the question asks, what's the difference in terms of their pressure at two different points? Because the difference in height is 3 meter, I can apply the rho gh formula and substitute the value 3 into rho gh and get the difference in water pressure. And they also provide us with the atmospheric pressure. I just have to add the atmospheric pressure and because they're asking for the pressure at the bottom of the tank, so I will use height equal to 5 and when I add them up, I will get 150,000 Pascal. So that's the highest amount of pressure in this rectangular tank. Now let's look into the next concept called uptrust. Again, we use density formula to relate to pressure. Now we're going to use the concept of pressure to relate to uptrust. So uptrust, it is the force experienced by an object when they are in the water. So let's look into the definition of Archimedes principle. It states that a body submerged in a fluid experiences an upward buoyant force equal to the weight of the fluid it displaces. Now, what do I mean by that? Look at this diagram here. Before this object was released into the water, you will see that, that the reading of the scale balance. But after I submerge the block into the water, you will see that the scale balance decreases in the reading. And why is that? That is because of uptrust. A force is pushing the object upwards. As a result, the reading decreases. And Archimedes principle states that the amount of water displaced here, if you were to measure their weight, you would have figured out the magnitude of uptrust in this scenario. So where does uptrust come from? It comes from the difference in pressure. So pressure is F over A and pressure can also be calculated using rho gh. If you put them together, you find out that F equal to P G H A. All right. And let's say I'm measuring the force at different point of the water here. And by minusing force two with force one, I would have found out the uptrust. So that's how you get it, PGH2A minus PGH1A, and then you will have found out that because H2 minus H1 is the difference in height, 
when you have the height and you have area, you got volume. That's why you can also calculate uptrust using rho g v. This uptrust comes from the difference in pressure between this point and also this point. If an object sinks, the uptrust is less than its weight because it's not enough to support the weight. But if it floats, it means the uptrust is greater than its weight. Now let's look into a work example of this principle. Say a cube of length 0.4 meter is submerged in water, and that's the density. What's the pressure at this point? So in this case, I'm, I can just use the rho g h formula, substitute 2 into the equation. And the second question asks for the uptrust. So what we learned just now is that we can use the formula rho g v, 1000 multiplied by 9.8, and the volume can be calculated using 0.4 qubit, and you'll get the amount of uptrust. All right, now let's look into something a little bit different which is related to spring. And the two types of forces you can apply to a string is compressive force when you compress it. Tensile force is when you elongate the spring. So we have learned this in IGCSE physics, spring investigation. So we vary the amount of weight and we see how much the spring extends. And then we will be able to draw a load extension graph. So what happens is that you increase the amount of load added to the spring and measure the extension and you will get a straight line until a certain point. If you were to calculate the gradient of this graph up to this limit here, you would have gotten a spring constant. Spring constant is a measure of how stiff the spring is, and it can be calculated using the formula F divided by X. If the spring constant is high, it means that you need to use a lot of force to extend the string by 1 cm. So it means that the spring is a lot stiffer. So we have another law in this study called the Hooke's law. It states that the amount of force that you apply is directly proportional to the extension that the spring will get until this point called the limit of proportionality. And after this point, you can see that the extension is no longer linear. It means that the spring is permanently damaged. So in terms of spring, we have different terms that you need to know. Elastic deformation is when the material returns to its original shape after applied force is removed. We have plastic deformation. It means that a material undergoes a permanent change in shape. You just can't go back. And elastic limit is the maximum stress a material can withstand before it begins to deform permanently. Now let's look into the concept of stress, strain, and Young modulus. So these terms are used to describe something very similar to force and extension, but in a non-spring context. Let's look into each quantity one by one. Strain is a measure of deformation relative to the material original size. So to measure that, you get the original length of the material. It doesn't have to be a spring. You get the extension when force is applied, and you have how much strain it gets. And it's a ratio, therefore it has no unit. Whereas stress, think of it like pressure. It's how much force you apply divided by how much area the force is concentrated into. Let's solve some question about stress and strain. Say I have a steel rod with a length of one meter, and this is the area force stretches. So by using the formula, I can calculate the strain and stress pretty easily. Just substitute the extension into the equation, substitute the original length, you will get the strain, substitute the force, substitute the area, you'll get the pressure. So this leads us to Young modulus, which uses both the stress and strain quantity to help us to measure a material stiffness. So in this case, the higher the Young modulus, the stiffer the material, meaning it will resist deformation and only stretch, compress slightly under a given stress. And the unit of Young modulus is Pascal. So if you look at a stress and strain graph, you can see it's very similar to a load extension graph. And then if you find a gradient of it, you would have found out the Young modulus. So this is the Young modulus of various material. The higher the value, the harder it is to stretch them. Right, that's it for stress strain and Young modulus. Now we'll look at the last subchapter, which is elastic potential energy. It is the energy that is stored in a material when it is deformed elastically. So if the elastic limit is not exceeded, this stored energy can be fully recovered. So how can we find out the amount of energy transfer whenever you work on a spring? So if the amount of energy exerted is constant, then the work done of formula can be used. So work done is energy transfer. It's calculated using force times distance. So if you look at this force extension graph here, the distance move is the extension. The force here is the force applied. Therefore, if you want to find out the work done, the energy transfer in the spring, what you can do is to just to calculate the area under this force extension graph. So it's a triangle. So I will just use half multiplied by F multiplied by X. And because we know that the spring constant formula, F k equal to F over X, F equal to kx, 
we can substitute f into this formula, which would have given us half kx squared. And that's how we find out how much energy is being transferred when we compress the string. But of course, this formula can only be used if the amount of force that you applied is constant. And for a non-linear force extension graph, you might need to use different methods such as integration, something you learn in math, to find out the solution. And that's the end of this chapter. Thank you so much for watching. I shall see you in the next video. Goodbye.